Welcome back. If you're unfamiliar with the Trojan War, or the story of how the Trojan War started, it can be kind of a tough epic to get into. So today I'd like to talk about the backstory of the Trojan War in hopes that you'll understand how this conflict took place in the, to begin with. So without further ado, I'd like to tell you the story of the Iliad backstory. It's complicated. It all begins, as so many of our stories do, when Zeus decided to take a mistress. Zeus fell in love with the sea nymph Thetis. And while he was having an affair with her, he learned that it was prophesied that Thetis would give birth to a child greater than his father. Hmm. Well, Zeus had really good reason to be afraid of something like this happening. Remember, he had overthrown his father, and his father had overthrown his father. So problems like this seem to run in the family. Zeus decides that the only reasonable solution to this problem is to marry off his mistress to a mortal man so that if they do have a child that's greater than the father, big deal. It's a child that's greater than a mortal. So. Zeus decides to handle this as humanely as possible. He has a lavish wedding for his ex-mistress on Mount Olympus. And here in this picture you can see uh, a Renaissance depiction of the marriage of Peleus and Thetis. Well, Zeus wanted everything to go well, so he didn't send out invites to the entire family. Instead, he left out an invitation to one goddess in particular, and that's Eris, the goddess of strife. Well, why didn't he want to invite strife? Because who wants strife at a wedding? There's enough drama anyway. So the wedding is going as planned, but of course, strife got wind that it was happening and showed up. And how did she cause trouble at the wedding? She made an apple out of gold, and she wrote, To the fairest on it. She rolled it into the middle of a crowd of goddesses. These goddesses were Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera. Each of the goddesses looked down at the apple and thought, oh, to the fairest, this must be me. And each reached down to grab it at the same time. You can imagine them kind of comically knocking heads with one another. They knew they needed an arbitrator to figure out who was, who was the fairest. Well, each of the gods refused the honor of deciding who was the fairest, because trust me, you wouldn't like Hera when she's mad. You wouldn't like any of these goddesses when they're mad. So they went and found a mortal. They went and found Paris to judge who was the fairest. Now, each of the goddesses made Paris an offer. Uh, Athena offered him wisdom. Hera offered him a great kingdom. And Aphrodite offered him the most beautiful woman on earth. Paris, being a teenage boy, of course chose the most beautiful woman on earth. Now, there's going to be a hitch with this, because as it'll turn out, the most beautiful woman on earth will be married at the time. Let's hold off on talking about the rest of this story for right now. We'll come back to this in a minute. Back to Peleus and Thetis. They're happily married, and they have a child. And their child's name is Achilles. When Achilles is just a tiny little boy, his father Peleus hands him over to the care and instruction of a centaur named Chiron. And Chiron would teach Achilles how to be strong and how to be a warrior and how to be a poet amongst other things. And Achilles would indeed grow up to be the greatest of the Greek warriors for this reason. Achilles grew up in Thea, Thea, P-H-T-H-I-A, here on the map, kind of in central Greece. But there are more households involved in this conflict than you can even imagine. There's also the house of Atreus. Atreus was from Mycenae. Mycenae. And Atreus, with his wife Irope, had two sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus. And they'll be some of the stars of our story as the story goes on. Agamemnon will be the leader of the Greek forces in our story, and Menelaus will be his sidekick and sort of second in command. Another household that's involved here is the household of Helen. It turns out 
that Zeus once again had a wandering eye, and he strayed from Hera and had an affair with a mortal woman named Leda. Turns out that Leda was married. She happened to be the queen of Sparta. Zeus pursued her and ended up impregnating Leda in the shape of a swan. And the product of this union was not only an egg, but twins, twins, um, Helen and Polydukes. Uh, and Leda also had children with her husband, Tyndarius, and these were Castor and Clytemnestra. Um, all of these characters will come back into our story later. The one you need to hold on to right now, though, is Helen. When Helen was born, she was born from, what else? An egg. And not surprisingly, this shows up in Greek comedy later on to great effect. Helen would grow up to marry Menelaus. Remember him? the son of Atreus, and together they would rule over Sparta. Agamemnon would marry Helen's sister, Clytemnestra, and together they would rule over Mycenae. This gets us to Paris. Remember Paris, the guy who was judging the competition between the goddesses? He's actually the brother of Hector and the son of King Priam and Queen Hecuba of Troy. And if you look at the map of ancient Greece here, you'll see that Troy is actually over here in what is now modern-day Turkey, while um, most of the places we'll be talking about were over here in modern-day Greece. Well, how does the trouble start? And this is a good question to ask. The trouble starts in the following way. Paris and his brother Hector go to visit Sparta on official state business. And while there, Paris falls madly in love with Helen. Remember how Paris was promised the most beautiful woman in the world? Well. Helen was the most beautiful woman in the world. She just happened to be married. This didn't stop Paris. Paris abducted Helen in the middle of the night and sailed first through Egypt, but then eventually back to Troy and came home with her, much to the surprise of his parents. Menelaus was hurt. Menelaus was very hurt. And he took his concerns to his brother, Agamemnon. And his brother, Agamemnon, decided that they needed to have a war to go get Helen back. They needed to fix this situation. Well, if we're going to learn about this war, you need to know what we're calling things in this war. There are some names to remember. Let's start here. On the Trojan side, one of the names that keeps coming up is Ilion, hence the name of the poem, the Iliad, because Ilion is another name for Troy. Dardania is also another name for Troy. Don't get confused. Often they won't even refer to Troy as Troy. It'll get one of these other names instead. People who live in Troy are often referred to as the Dardanians. They have a king. His name is Priam. He has 50 sons and 12 daughters. Quite impressive. He has a wife. Her name is Hecuba. Sometimes you'll see her name is spelled with a K. He has a son. His name is Hector. And he's the greatest of the Trojan warriors. They have another son. His name is Paris. We've already met him. He's the one with the bad judgment. Their nephew, Aeneas, is a Trojan warrior who is also the son of Aphrodite and a mortal guy named Anchises. He's important. We see him in Book 5 when Diomedes is on a killing spree. Hector has a wife. Her name is Andromache. And they have a son. His name is Astyanax. And Astyanax's name means Lord of the City. Another great Trojan warrior is a guy named Glaucus. And he'll show up in a couple of places in this war, but mainly in an exchange between him and the Greek soldier Diomedes. On the Greek side of the conflict, we get a whole bunch of names for who the Greeks are. They're often referred to as the Achaeans. This is because there's a region in Greece called Achaea. The Argives, uh, they're called the Argives because there's a region in Greece called Argos. Uh, they're referred to as the Teucrians after a region in Greece called Teucria. And they're often referred to as the Danans. This is difficult to remember, especially since Danan sounds a whole like Dardanian. Sorry about that. Remember, Achaeans, Argives, Teucrians, and Danans are all the same thing. They're all Greeks. They have a leader. His name is Agamemnon the king of Mycenae, brother of Menelaus. Menelaus, 
the reason why all of this trouble got started in the first place is the king of Sparta. You'll hear about this group of people in this story referred to as Myrmidons. And this is the name of the group of people who sail from the state of Thea. And their leader is uh, Achilles, as we know. Another big character in this story is Odysseus, who is from Ithaca. And he's famous for being the most clever of all the Greeks. Uh, he's so clever that he can talk his way into making things happen in a way that most others can't. More from him later. You'll hear about a guy named Ajax, or Telamonian Ajax, or Big Ajax. And he's the second best of the fighters of the Greeks after Achilles. And he's from the town of Salamis. We'll also meet Diomedes, especially in books 5 and 6. And he's the third best of all the Greeks. Uh, he's a tough, tough guy. He's also from the Greek mainland. He's from Tiryns. Early on, we meet Nestor, who is a trusted sage advisor of the Greeks. and He's from Pylos. We'll meet Phoenix, a friend and advisor to Achilles. Um, he's a guy who actually gets adopted by Achilles' father long ago, and he gets his own kingdom for being such a cool guy. And last but not least, we'll meet Patroclus, Achilles' best friend and a member of the Myrmidons. The war gets off to kind of a strange start. Uh, they can't actually sail at first because they have, a, they have a problem at their rally point. They all get together and rally at the town of Aulus here in central Greece, but they can't get a wind to sail. Odysseus doesn't show up at first. Achilles doesn't show up at first. Um, Achilles gets hidden by his mother on the Isle of Skuros. Um, Odysseus won't come to the war and pretends to be crazy at first. Uh, we, later on, uh, of course, the Greeks convince him to join in the fighting because they want him to join in the glory. And it works out. They can't get a wind to sail. And unfortunately, bad things have to happen in order to get a wind to sail. Agamemnon is forced to sacrifice his own daughter, Iphigenia, in order to get a wind to take them over to get this war started in Troy. This will cause problems between him and his wife later, as you may imagine. Achilles, who has been hiding out on the island of Skuros, will do strange things. He'll dress up in drag to hide out from Odysseus and the other Greeks when they come to get him. And he'll actually end up getting the daughter of the king of Skuros pregnant. This will result in the child Neoptolemus, who we'll meet later in the Aeneid. Suffice to say, they all get to war eventually, and where we start in the story is actually at the very, very end of the Trojan War. There's only about another year left as Book One of the Iliad begins. That is, then, to say, you're reading what is an episode in the Trojan War. Just an episode. More on these in video number seven.